And now that the room has filled up, it's an appropriate moment for me, therefore, now to make my third point to introduce our very distinguished speaker we have today. And I'll just briefly describe his achievements. Christopher Hood received a BA First Class in Social Sciences Politics from the University of York in 1968, a B-Lit from the University of Chicago, University of Glasgow, sorry, forgive me, in 1971, and a D-Lit from the University of York in 1987. Just a small note of history, he did spend one year at the National University of Singapore in the Faculty of Law from 1984 to 1985, which is why, Christopher, it's appropriate you're giving this lecture surrounded by the Faculty of Law all around you in this upper quadrangle. He's also a prolific author who has authored and co-authored 15 books on a wide range of topics. There's almost no major issue of public policy that Christopher has not touched upon in his writing. And I'll give you a few examples. In the blame game, Christopher shows how blame avoidance shapes the workings of government and public services, delving into the inner workings of complex institutions, he proves how a better understanding of blame avoidance can improve the quality of modern governance, management, and organizational design. In The Art of the State, another book, he examines contradictory recipes for the improvement of public services and actually asks a very large question whether the forces of modernity will produce worldwide convergence in the way of organizing government. But as you, can as you could tell from my opening remarks, we see greater divergence than convergence on how to organize government. In another book, The Government of Risk, Understanding Risk Regulation Regimes, he systematically examines risk, rescue, risk regulation regimes across policy, domain, across policy domains, the significant driving forces shaping them, and the causes of regulatory failures and success. Uh, his latest book, A Government That Worked Better and Cost Less, evaluating three decades of reform and change in UK central government, has won several awards. Uh, it won the Louis Brownlow Book Award, from the National Academy of Public Administration. And in November 2016, it was awarded the, G the WJM McKenzie Award of the Political Studies Association. The jury stated that the book carries considerable implications for policy making, as well as in the, in the field of academic inquiry, which it addresses. So today, uh, Professor Christopher Hood has agreed to speak to us on austerity reflecting on how multidisciplinary analysis is required for some of the most important questions on austerity policies and their consequences. And before inviting, can I please remind you again, please don't whisper, the tent will pick up your whispers. So over to you, Christopher. It's a picture of a character in a well-known short story by the American writer Washington Irving. The name of this person is Rip Van Winkle, and in the story, he's an 18th century Dutch settler in America who goes to sleep for several decades, and when he wakes up, the humor of the story is about everything that's changed during the decades that he's been asleep, um, and some of the things that haven't changed. Well, I feel a bit like Rip Van Winkle uh, coming back to Singapore after uh, having been here as a lecturer in the mid-1980s. And in those days, I was teaching public administration to undergraduates in the law faculty here, which at that time was at Kent Ridge, not on this campus. Um, and the law faculty was headed by the uh, distinguished uh, Professor Tan Suk Yi, who was Dean of the Faculty at that time, um, and of course, um, Lee Kuan Yew, the um, legendary Prime Minister of Singapore, after whom this school is named, um, was at the height of his powers at that time. Um, that was in some ways a, a very different Singapore to the one that we're in now. Um, it had less than half the population, 
um, that we have in Singapore now. The technology was all different, no PowerPoint in those days, uh, no mobile phones, very few computers, um, and though the street names were the same, uh, all of the buildings were different, or almost all. Of course, there are a few things that haven't changed as well. The, uh, the ruling party, Singapore's uh, distinctive style of capitalism in many respects, um, and its position as uh, a key uh, crossroads in Asia. So that's how I'm, uh, I'm feeling right now. Now, Kishore, uh, Kishore the, the, the dean, um, in his opening remarks yesterday, um, said that the object of public policy was to make people's lives better. And who could disagree with that? Not me. Um, but I want to talk about a different kind of policy that on the face of it seems to have the opposite effect, namely what's known as austerity policy, policy as it's, it's now called, and which, under different terminology, um, was a significant theme in the Western policy literature in the 1970s and 1980s, a time which was also a time, by the way, in which expertise, particularly economic expertise, was very severely questioned and challenged in the policy and political process. Indeed, one of the landmark books uh, on that subject at this time was published in 1978 by no less than Guy Peters, the, the, the president of your executive committee, together with his co-author Richard Rose. And that book was entitled, Can Government Go Bankrupt? And in, in that book, uh, Guy Peters and, and Richard Rose um, focused on the political crises that result not when um, states run into the costs of bailing out failing mega banks, but more in their day, what happens when the continuing demands for maintaining and increasing uh, welfare state policies run up against falling take-home pay for citizens in a, in a context of slow economic growth or recession, as was happening in a number of uh, countries uh, in the Western states at that time. And indeed, when I was working here in Singapore uh, in the mid-1980s, I was working on a similar topic as well, um, together with the late Andrew Dunsire, uh, we were working on how public bureaucracies, in that case the, the, the bureaucracies of Whitehall in Britain, um, responded to pressures on their resources, on pressures for uh, cutbacks, how far and in what way they were capable of responding selectively to such pressures. Um, and we predicted, correctly as it turned out, that bureaucratic downsizing had a lot further to go. And although writing this book was outside my comfort zone in some respects, um, in other ways it wasn't. I was working with a fellow public administration academic. Um, we were programmed to think in similar kinds of ways about um, bureaucracy and government service. Over 30 years later, I'm still working on um, a broadly uh, similar topic. And um, the, the Kishore wasn't quite correct in describing a government that cost, uh, that cost less and, and worked better as my latest book, because a few weeks ago, um, modestly priced and handsomely bound, um, I uh, have published a, a book on the politics of fiscal squeeze over a uh, hundred years in the UK, and that's part of a pair of studies 
um, one of which looked at uh, a, a comparative approach of uh, a fiscal squeeze and its politics in different times and places from the, um, the um, uh, American uh, Great Recession shortly after the creation of the modern United States in the 1830s um, up to uh, Argentina in the 2000s. Uh, and so one was a comparative study and the other was a uh, over time study of a single uh, state. Um, and for these books, I was out going outside my comfort zone um, because um, I was not working with fellow public administration academics who thought in the same way as me, um, but with uh, economists and econometricians who certainly didn't. And that's the, the challenge I want to talk about today. Now, these two books um, reflect the times that they were written in. Um, and uh, as uh, I note, um, as, uh, as, as, and you would have to be Rip Van Winkle not to, to realize this, uh, authority, uh, austerity has been a major theme um, of policy debates and academic writing over the, the past um, decade, um, especially in some of the Western welfare states um, and many developing countries as well. Um, and the, if, if we, one way of thinking about this is to um, look on scope on Scopus, the the, the largest ab, abstract and citation uh, database of peer-reviewed literature, and this shows you what the uh, total of um, publications uh, under the search term austerity um, were produced between 1960 to 2008, and then in the uh, eight years from 2009 to 2016, you see a big, uh, you see a big jump there. And some of the issues that have been debated and that you'll probably want to uh, tweet and, uh, and raise today um, turn on questions like whether austerity policies are good or bad for things like economic growth, equality, happiness, um, whether austerity policies are electorally sustainable in democracies, something that I know some of you have, uh, have written about, and what sort of changes austerity policies lead to or can lead to in state structures or the way that public services are delivered. But some of um, these debates that have been much in evidence since uh, 2008, um, repeat um, issues that were explored or contested in earlier eras of fiscal stress or crisis. And there are three features, I think, of today's austerity debates that can be said to be common with those of the 1970s and 1980s. One is that most of the writing about austerity in public policy is normative, um, perhaps rightly so, putting the case for, or much more commonly in academic writing, against uh, uh, austerity, often with considerable passion and forceful examples. And that sort of debate reflects or is reflected in political and public debates um, across much of the Western world, not least in my own country, um, which um, in a recent general election just a few weeks ago, uh, in, in which at a recent general election just a few weeks ago, the, the voters managed somehow, um, despite the first-past-the-post electoral system, which is designed to avoid such an outcome, to send the message, none of the above, 
to all of the four biggest political parties uh, in the system. Um, a second feature of, um, the, uh, of, of this literature is that um, there are different approaches and in that sense different comfort zones um, that we can see um, economists and uh, political scientists or public administrationists um, occupying um, as they work um, on these uh, topics. And I've, I've sketched out, probably caricatured, you will want to argue, um, some of the, of the differences in emphasis or comfort zones that uh, I see as between those two uh, disciplines working in that area. The political science literature tends to be interested in how the decision-making process works. Um, particularly in terms of how far states can uh, can mount capacity to um, concentrate resources and 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 and, and make um, selective choices as between uh, across the board or standard um, cuts. Um, econometricians and economists tend to be more interested in the type and degree of correction achieved in uh, debt and deficit, and in particular the consequences of those policies for economic growth um, in shorter and longer term. But of course, um, there's some overlap between those uh, approaches, particularly, um, for instance, in exploring the electoral effects of, uh, of um, <coughs> austerity policies, one that's much been debated in political science, but in which some economists have also explored. And part of my journey over the last five years or so has been uh, crossing these uh, comfort zones, or at least um, navigating uh, across them. Uh, a third feature of um, discussions about austerity that I think are closely related to the second point I made um, is a notable variety and ambiguity about what exactly the key variable is here. That is to say, how do we measure or register what we're going to count as austerity? Again, this is not a new issue. And it applied just as much to the debates of the 1980s as those of the 2010s. Indeed, um, Richard Rose, Guy Peters' um, co-author in the, the book I mentioned, Can Government Go Bankrupt, um, drew attention to this issue uh, very sharply a generation ago uh, in a paper in which um, Richard Rose called, no doubt with his tongue in his cheek, for a moratorium on the use of the word cuts um, because of the confusion that arose from a single word being used to denote very widely different uh, phenomena. And Rose said in that paper, and I quote, I think this is verbatim, whether public spending is increasing or declining is a matter of definition, not fact. Um, and I think, again, the issues of how we define this phenomenon that Rose was highlighting all those years ago still confront today's generation of scholars and commentators in this field. What exactly is austerity? Um, what are we to count as cuts in public spending? How do we recognize these things when we see them? Can we uh, distinguish different types or levels. Um, and in the remainder of my talk, um, I want to focus on this issue. Um, and again, reflecting on my own recent uh, experience of trying to work uh, across comfort zones with those coming from the tradition of economics or econometrics. And I want to make um, three arguments here. 
um, I want to suggest that there isn't any single way of defining austerity. Um, and I want to argue that what we see in terms of the developments we can observe actually depends on how we choose to define austerity. And the same goes for the consequences that we might attribute to uh, austerity uh, policies. <clears throat> and in, in particular, the, the long debated issue in political science about how far um, voters punish in democracies incumbents uh, for such policies. And I want to argue that that also, to some extent, uh, depends on how we define uh, austerity. Now, coming to that first point, I showed you uh, uh, a little while ago the, the slide in which I showed the incidence of, of peer-reviewed uh, papers and publications on the topic of austerity in different uh, periods. And I think one of the reasons for that change um, was that linguistic usage has altered. Um, the word austerity has come uh, to be used in a different way um, to what it was before. And that's apt to happen when you do that sort of word search uh, analysis uh, of that kind. Um, and if we think about austerity in its broad meaning as imposing constraint or restraint um, on uh, individuals, clearly there are a number of ways in which that can happen. Um, it can be self-imposed or externally imposed. Um, it can be imposed by the state or by other bodies. And when the state imposes austerity, um, it can do that by fiscal means, taxes, uh, charges, public spending, um, or by non-fiscal means, such as rationing of goods, wage caps, prohibitions of one kind or another, um, a, a monetary uh, policy. And indeed, when I was growing up, as a, as, a, as, a, as a child in the 1940s and 19, uh, early 1950s in the UK. We lived essentially in a Soviet-type planned economy. Everything was rationed, um, and, uh, and uh, taxes were very high as well. It seems to me that even if you lay non-fiscal austerity aside, and I think it's dangerous to do that if you want to look in the round at how much deprivation or restraint any given population is being exposed to. I think there is also uh, no uh, single way to represent even fiscal uh, austerity. If we look at, if we just look at, uh, at fiscal um, uh, measures, um, we have the choice, for example, as to whether we look at austerity in terms of are we interested in deficit reduction or are we interested in f fiscal squeezes. I'll show you in a minute that there really is a difference between those two. Are we interested in what, uh, in the announcement effects of, of, of um, austerity, or are we interested in enactment? Those two things are not the same. Um, what threshold of significance are we going to take in deciding whether um, a, an episode is a time of austerity or not? There are no standards, standard conventions for any of that. Um, and there's also the issue that Rose was touching on when he argued that there should be a moratorium on the word cuts. Are we interested in disappointed expectations, for example, reductions on, on planned increases, or are we interested in, in changes relative to uh, the previous year's uh, outturns? Um, and 
are we interested in a combination of, of spending and taxes or just spending as much of the public administration literature on austerity uh, examines and whether we are interested in absolute changes or changes relative to GDP. These, these all produce different landscapes of austerity. And even if we just stay in the realm of, of, of um, taxation and, 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 and spending, and we think of making some fairly simple distinctions um, between whether spending or taxation are, are falling or rising respectively in real money terms, um, that, uh, that present you with a more varied landscape of types of austerity. And I'm sure that uh, in the discussion you'll be able to add to this list. Um, but it, even if you take this fairly simple set of distinctions, you can start to observe that these, that these types of austerity are not e uh, equally common what I've called double hard squeeze, um, the, the kind of austerity in which you're cutting spending both absolutely and relative to GDP, and uh, you're raising taxes both absolutely and relative to GDP. This is very, very rare. In uh, our comparative study of nine, uh, uh, of nine fiscal squeeze episodes in different times and places. We only found one that fitted that category, Argentina in the 2000s. Um, and in the 100-year uh, study of the UK between, 2000, uh, between 1900 and 2015, we also only found one case. And both of those were freaks. Um, so most of the types um, uh, are more uh, are, 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 are milder than that. So this is uh, this is my my first point that defining austerity is a challenging intellectual problem for scholars like us um, trying to get a grip on this phenomenon. Of course, uh, there there is. Um, the I know it when I see it test. Um, this, is, uh, this was made famous uh, just over 50 years ago in an American Supreme Court case um, when a Supreme Court Justice, Justice Potter Stewart, um, who was uh, giving uh, his uh, ruling on an obscenity case, said that while he couldn't define um, in, the, in this particular case, what he could not define was, quote, hardcore pornography, but he knew it when he saw it. And I have had similar kinds of reactions on austerity. We can't define it, but we know it when we see it. I think that that's not really satisfactory for scholars like ourselves, and nor do I think it's satisfactory for judges. Judges ought to be able to define the legal concepts that they're, that they're um, ruling on, in my opinion. Uh, and similarly, um, I think we as scholars need to wrestle with these, uh, with these difficulties. Now, the, um, the second point I want to make uh, in relation to this problem of trying to pin down different meanings of austerity and compare them, um, is that the kinds of distinctions that I've been mentioning um, are uh, not just um, uh, 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 not just a matter of of, of comparing types, um, but also the, the different way that you define. Uh, austerity uh, depends on what kind of historical um, will determine what kind of historical uh, trends and changes that you see. In this case, um, it affects the issue of how many episodes we see. 
Um, for example, if we, this, this is data from the UK in a 100 year study, and this is looking at giving you two graphs, uh, or two, 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 two graphs, the top one shows um, what the squeeze episodes look like if we define them in terms of significant rises in revenue or falls in spending relative to GDP. Um, and the one at the bottom shows you squeeze episodes defined as significant reductions in deficit. They're not the same. You get roughly half the cases um, if you take the deficit measure or deficit reduction measure than if you take the, uh, the uh, fiscal squeeze measure. So it really does matter for, um, uh, for uh, what trends you see. Um, similarly, um, what, um, what you see in terms of changes in the mix of spending relative to revenue um, certainly requires you to look both at revenue changes and spending cuts, whereas very often in the public administration literature, including the book that I was writing here in Singapore back in the 80s, uh, only looked at the spending side. Uh, and yet, um, looking over 100 years at the UK developments, one of the things that, 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 um, that, that, that we noticed was a, a, a seemingly um, less lower incidence of tax squeezes in the later part of our 100 year period than we'd found uh, earlier. And <clears throat> third uh, on this um, is the changes in the balance between what we call the surgery without anesthetics approach um, to fiscal squeeze and the boiling frogs approach. Look away now if you're squeamish Surgery without anaesthetics um, reflects the, the idea that uh, if cuts uh, or squeezes are to be uh, imposed, they need to be done quickly um, in, uh, to, to match a political cycle. Um, in, the, in the case of surgery, and I remember having surgery in the general uh, Singapore General Hospital here in the 1980s, and it's still true, speed is of the essence um, to reduce shock, even where sedation or anaesthetic uh, is involved. Um, against that is the uh, boiling frogs approach, referring to the idea or myth, never properly tested as far as I know, um, that it's possible to boil a frog alive if you only heat the water slowly enough to, 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 to lull it uh, into um, a, a, a full sense of, of security. Now, when we, when we looked at different episodes in the uh, varieties of, of fiscal squeeze in the UK over a century in terms of making this um, distinction between uh, types of squeeze. Um, what we found was that in the later period, we had uh, squeeze episodes that looked more like the boiling frogs approach, whereas in the earlier episodes, we, we saw more types of squeezes that fitted the surgery without anesthetics approach. Um, and this is a finding that we didn't necessarily know we were looking for, um, and it's not an observation that, as far as I know, is predicted by any received theory, though I'd be very interested to, uh, to hear what you think uh, about that. Um, and I don't think that there's any well-known um, or received explanation for it. Um, so in that sense, it's the, the kind of observation um, that, such as, as cosmologists uh, have to grapple with when they stumble across the idea, as they did in 1998, that the universe was expanding at an accelerating rate. 
that's not an observation particularly ex expected, um, but it's something that once you've noticed it, you start thinking, well, how could we explain this? What's behind it? Um, and then, finally, um, I think how we define austerity matters for for the third item that uh, I mentioned, that is to say what, what, what consequences we attribute to uh, austerity policy, notably um, in, the, in, in the, uh, the idea of uh, the electoral toxicity or otherwise of austerity policies. And what we conclude about that also uh, depend on how we measure or categorize uh, austerity. Um, as many of you will know much better than me, the, the issue of how far or in what ways voters punish incumbent politicians for good economic performance or punish them for bad performance is something that's preoccupied students of economic voting for at least 40 years. And while comparative analysis of voting has established over all those decades that um, while voters in most countries normally put uh, economic performance very high in survey responses about what questions, what issues most concern them, they don't seem to systematically or invariably uh, reward or punish uh, incumbent governments over that performance. Rather, we find uh, strong evidence for such rewarding and punishing behavior in some countries and some time periods, but not in others. Um, and we find uh, exactly the same sort of thing um, with um, when we look at, at austerity policies more specifically in terms of, of efforts to raise taxes or restrain uh, public spending, we similarly see a lack of systematic uh, voter punishment, and that was something that we found both in the comparative study that I mentioned and in the over time uh, study. So um, what we also find here is that um, how we define austerity episodes um, really uh, makes a big difference to the strength of the association between um, incumbent loss um, and austerity. Um, and in some cases, it even affects the sign of that relationship, um, that is to say, for some types of soft squeeze in our analysis, um, the observed risk um, of incumbent electoral loss is actually less than if there's no squeeze. Um, so again, I think there are some uh, puzzling issues to be uh, explored there. I, I won't go into uh, more details, but we can, we can do that in a discussion. I think that I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll close uh, now. What I've been arguing um, today, when we as public policy scholars address the much debated and salient issue of austerity policy, it is as true today as it was when Guy Peters and Richard Rose were writing almost 40 years ago that austerity is a surprisingly slippery thing to define, and that what we see and what conclusions we draw about it um, will uh, depend on uh, what definitions we decide to use. As soon as we start to enter into questions about patterns of historical development um, or about relationships between cause and effect, such as I've just been talking about, the, the issue of, of definition um, becomes really uh, important. Uh, I'm not trying to argue here 
that either the econometricians or the political scientists or public administrationists have all the right answers or that one approach is inherently superior to the other. And I don't want to argue against specialization in science either. Both of those things, um, are, I think, uh, are important. Um, but I do want to argue that, as I've tried to show you this afternoon, um, you can start to see things about austerity um, if you do do some boundary crossing between the comfort zones um, of uh, the way uh, economists look at austerity and fiscal squeeze and the way that uh, public administrationists might do, um, both in discovering puzzles such as the time pattern between the surgery without anesthetics and the uh, boiling frogs, um, and in throwing um, uh, more light on puzzles such as voter punishment. And I started with a, with a painting, so I'm going to um, finish with one. And this is the one that you, you see on the screen right now. Um, and this is a, an exhibition that I went to in, in London last year, um, which was on the subject of uh, what happened when painting and photography came together in the 19th century. Um, to produce both different kinds of art, um, for example, the ability for, for painters to use photography to do multiple portraits of a kind that wouldn't otherwise be possible, and also the, the, the use of, uh, of uh, artistic uh, uh, concepts of, of the, looking at light um, in photography, and producing uh, different kinds of art that were neither pure photography um, nor, um, nor pure painting in the traditional sense. And I, I think that that's, the, uh, that, that, that's struck me as, uh, as an interesting uh, metaphor for, how, uh, for the sort of challenge we might face as creative public policy analysts. So the the, the, the short way of saying what I've been talking about for 40 minutes or so is that straying outside the comfort zones of different specialisms is always risky, but can sometimes be productive. Thank you. Well, let, me, let me begin, uh, Christopher, by saying that one word I didn't you, hear you use, unless I'm mistaken, is uh, culture. And from, so from, you know, as you know, Asia went through a major financial crisis in 97, 98, and there was tremendous austerity uh, imposed on Asian societies. And the reactions were actually quite different. For example, I mean, the, in many countries, uh, austerity leads to the people becoming unhappy, right? Normally they do. But surprisingly, in the case of South Korea, you know, old ladies took out their jewelry and said, my country needs me, I'm going to give my jewelry to the country, and I'm going to save my country. So in a sense, uh, uh, people reacted sort of positively to the crisis and say, I want to help my country. Now, is, is culture a factor, therefore, in reactions to austerity? I, I'm sure you're quite right. Um, I, I stayed at a simpler level of analysis, and I was just trying to show you how you could, how you could how you could think about austerity simply in terms of more, um, more conventional and, and more tangible measures. But yes, I'm quite sure that, 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 that um, public mood, etc., is extremely important. The way I see it, you're dealing with some of the technicalities of tax and spend and how austerity works out in terms of uh, government budgets and that sort of thing. But I wonder if the main issue for not only for voters, but for many other people, is actually the outcomes of austerity. And in particular, the way in which austerity reduces public goods and public services, which you know, cannot really be provided by the private sector and have to be provided by government. And it seems to me that the experience of the recent elections in the United Kingdom are that people, especially with the reaction to the Labour Manifesto, uh, 
is that people are getting increasingly worried and the Grenfell Tower fires and that sort of thing, increasingly worried about the uh, crisis in various public services from the National Health Service to local government spending to the police force, etc., etc. Th that may very well be true. Very nice to meet uh, another York alumnus. Um, but but that, that may very well uh, be true. Um, but I, I would still say that um, we would want to put the the episode of 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 squeeze that you've been referring to into a kind of historical perspective how does it compare with other with the earlier incidents um, on various metrics and how do we compare the uh, the relationship um, with electoral outcomes and in 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 our study we also looked at uh, issues about shaping the state. It's often argued that, uh, that that when money runs out, there are big challenges in terms of of developing new ways of delivering public services. Um, and so we looked at, at that as well. Was there evidence of 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 tightness of money squeeze-related innovation? Um, and we found some evidence of that. Um, but we weren't convinced that um, even in some very severe squeeze episodes, such as the, the big cuts in the 1920s um, after, the, uh, after the, the First World War, um, that there was a lot of dramatic reshaping of the state going on. Yes, it, it did less, um, but... Um, there wasn't a kind of selective reshaping as we found it. How, that's right. I want to see here, uh, how do uh, we decide a, def a definition of austerity? So it's, uh, it's uh, uh, it decided by experts or public opinion or de through deliberation. Uh, I think, uh, as you said, uh, it is definition is very important, but how to decide it, uh, I, I want to hear to you. What I've been trying to argue is that you need to operate with multiple definitions so that you can see the difference that it makes, um, which type of definition you do use. The, the, there are alternative ways that you can do it, but I think you can't avoid grappling with issues such as thresholds. If you don't, then you end up with nonsensical conclusions because you, would, you might regard a, 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 a point uh, in time in which you get a 0.0001% uh, reduction in spending uh, as, as different from one where you had a 0.001% increase in spending. Um, so you can't avoid getting to issues about thresholds. And I don't think there's an established um, way of, of doing that. What we did find in the, uh, the comparative study was that there are kind of rules of thumb that, that, um, that international bodies use um, that might help us here. For example, we found that the IMF Fiscal Affairs Division um, rec used, to, used to work on the, the rule of thumb that about 1% of GDP per year was normally the kind of politically, the, the, the politi limit of political tolerance in most kinds of, 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 of countries to, um, to, uh, to, to, to squeezes. But that's not something for which we have standard conventions. My question is, in your experience, with, with which types of economists can we have a useful dialogue uh, are, apps, uh, are able to facilitate or actually attract uh, this, this, these sort of economists. Uh, my second question linked to that is you, you touched upon the related subject of growth, uh, or, or in, in, in any case of government uh, revenue, which relates to, to growth, which of course relates to how you measure growth. And we're still stuck in the idea that the only way to measure growth is through GDP. Um, in your work, do you, do, you, do you also look at other ways of measuring growth, or sustainable growth, 
growth for whom, for which social classes and so on, uh, and in your discussions with economists, does, does this sort of thing come up, or do we remain wedded to this, uh, uh, what I think is an unsatisfactory concept and unit of measure? I, I, I'm sure you're right about the, the, the growth issue, and that's much debated. No, we didn't do that in, in, in the studies that I've been talking about, but I fully recognize the, uh, the importance of, of that issue. Um, what um, I have in mind, um, and I worked with, uh, I, I worked with Rosanna Himas, um, who is, a, who is a, an econometrician who has worked um, on uh, development uh, studies. Um, and um, what I think that we were trying to get at was that to combine the qualitative analysis of, of the kind that I would associate more with political science or, or public administration with the analysis of reported financial outcomes, which is what Econometricians almost by definition work with, but if you do work with with um, reported financial outcomes, you're always going to be looking in the rear view mirror um, because these things uh, look back. Um, and if you're interested in in the point at which, for example, bad news is announced, that often comes well before the the announcement as works through uh, into reported outcome um, figures. And that really, if, if we're interested in what might be the electoral effects of that, um, we, we have to include a different set of elections with a different timing issue. Um, and what, I, what we, we did do, I didn't talk about this today, but uh, you'll find it in both of, of, of the books. We worked with a, with, with a, with a a measure of the, or a qualitative measure of the political stress involved um, in imposing uh, squeezes. Um, for example, whether election pledges came into question, um, how, how, how much um, public com compliance there was. We had a, uh, we, we worked with that and we tried to map that onto uh, onto the, um, the the more standard econometric measures to see how far there was uh, there was agreement between them. So I think this was um, in this particular um, case um, a serious uh, a serious dialogue. I, I would never uh, pretend that we've solved all these difficult problems, but 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 I think the the the, the, the was an attempt to try to bring the, the qualitative and the quantitative together. Um, and I believe it's a step in the right direction. That was as well. Um, all right, so the first question from the audience is as follows. Can social psychology as well as economics contribute to the study of the policy of austerity? Any kind of striking differences in terms of the austerity perceived in the British context and then in the US context. Um, and the last question, so I was just wondering, because since the main premise of your, uh, one of the main premises of your uh, discussion of your, of your talk was about the lack of, under, of lack of common understanding of austerity and its meanings, would, in your opinion, that have um, big um, implications in terms of addressing austerity, or to what extent uh, would that impact on um, on addressing austerity in, in in this complex world? Three questions there, I think. Um, how important is uh, social psychology? Can we bring that in? Surely we can. Um, one of the 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 issues that I think would be particularly important. In, from a social psychological perspective is the issue of expectations uh, and how they relate to satisfaction, something that um, we commonly find applied in public administration to evaluating public services and, and their performance. 
Um, and, and I think that maybe some of the puzzles that I've been discussing um, do come down to expectations um, and, uh, and how, far, um, how, how far austerity measures affect expectations. Do expectations come down? Do they remain the same? How do they relate to those things? Those seem to me to be very important questions that uh, certainly ought to be explored. Second, I, I, there was a question about the, the, the source of the data. Um, I should explain, perhaps I didn't do so adequately, that um, I, I did a, a pair of studies. One um, looking at a number of episodes of, of fiscal squeeze in different times and places of which we had one episode from the UK, but all the others were from uh, other countries. And the other was a, 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 a study of all the episodes of fiscal squeeze measured in one way or another, multiple ways, in fact, in the UK uh, over 100 years. So in one case, we're looking at, uh, at comparative, comparing things in different times and places. In another case, we're looking at, at the other study, we're looking at all the, the episodes in the UK um, over a century. So uh, some of it's from the UK, but the, but the comparative study was, uh, was not. I, I don't think I completely understood what was being said about the, um, the, U, uh, the United States. I didn't really get that one. What, what, what I've been trying to say, and I, I'm, as I say, I, I've, I've reiterated what, what Guy Peters and his, his colleague Richard Rose were saying back in the 1970s and early 80s, um, that uh, what, you, uh, what, what, you, what you define as cuts, in their case, or uh, austerity, is quite slippery. Um, that there are a number of, of ways of doing it, and there isn't a standard or received way of, of, of solving those problems. I, I think that this is something which we as scholars of, of, of public policy have to grapple with. Uh, um, and uh, as the discussion that we've had uh, here this afternoon has shown, not surprisingly, there are a whole lot of other complicated things that people think we ought to add in the, um, issues about social psychology, for instance, and other things that I'm sure are important, but they, they, they add to this point that I'm making that this is an elusive concept, more elusive than you might think from the way that it's debated. I want to, to offer another uh, use of austerity that uh, is very much um, in vogue in where I'm currently working in Australia. Um, Australians have a huge resistance to the idea of the global financial crisis because they insist that it didn't happen there and so it can't be global. Um, but austerity for them is a very useful discursive tool for defining what's happening elsewhere but not what's happening in Australia. Um, and so there's, there's something else I think going on with the term austerity beyond um, what you're describing which is coming up very much in an international research project I'm involved in. Um, but my, my, I, have, I have two related questions, and I, I'll be brief. I mean, the first is we spend a great deal of time at this conference talking about the relationship between scholarship and, and, and policy influence. Also suggest um, no neat solutions. You know, you're not coming up with a, if you want to address austerity, you do these three things, or if you want to look like you're not doing austerity when you are, you do these three things. So I'm just intrigued by how you see yourself in that space between scholar and policy influencer. And my related question, if I may, uh, just because this is something that, again, that we, we sort of do and don't talk about at this conference, is one of the things that we, we do know a little bit about is the the differential impacts in terms of gender of austerity policies, however you define them. And I was just wondering if that was something that had appeared in your research at all, um, and if so, whether, whether there was anything um, useful that, that the data suggests about that. 
In the UK, there was a period in the dying days of the Labour government before it was, uh, before it was replaced by a, a coalition government when it was not politically acceptable um, to mention publicly um, the idea of public spending cuts. This was, this was a political no-no. It couldn't be done. However, it was possible to have a historical discussion of uh, what had happened in the past. And I was indeed called in to the Treasury to talk about the 1920s. They weren't allowed to talk about the 2010s. So we were talking about the 1920s, but they were really talking about the 2010s. And I think that that might be considered to be um, a, a a way in which uh, scholarship was able to, uh, to, uh, to, to factor into uh, policy discussions in that kind of circumstances where, where certain ideas are taboo and that was the only way into it. And, 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 and that indeed was what I did do in uh, 2009. Um, and at that time, because there had been such a, a long period of, of, of public spending growth, public spending roughly doubled um, in, in a fairly short period of time, um, there, were, there, was re there was only one person left in the Treasury that had any experience of restraining public spending. So such knowledge as there was uh, only came from, uh, from academics or scholars, because they just didn't have it in, 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 the, in, in the government uh, department. So I think that, um, that, that sometimes historical uh, studies can be uh, important. I think um, your point about uh, gender effects is also very important. Um, and uh, we, did, uh, we did look at those. Uh, where we could. I, I think a, a very striking example of, 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 of that um, came again in our studies of the 1920s, uh, um, where we found that overwhelmingly the cuts um, in the public service were cuts on female employees. Um, who happened to be temporary. Um, so there was a, a, a very clear uh, distributional effects. Um, but the point's very well taken. And, 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 and I think also your point about what gets swept up in the re rhetoric of, of austerity is, is, is also something that I fully recognize. I wanted to ask you if you have been doing any sort of research on the way uh, or is there a big difference uh, for people, you know, in the way they perceive austerity when it comes from at the outside rather than it comes from uh, the political level at the domestic level? Um, is there a different perception? Is there a different way to measure it? Is there a different way to absorb it? Or is there a different way to tolerate it? In, in, the, compa in the comparative study, we did, um, we, we did try to... Um, Make a, make a, include in our comparisons the extent to which um, the, 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 the fiscal measures are a product of some kind of external um, uh, restraint coming, for example, from bailout conditions or things of that kind. Um, and we did discuss that um, in, in, the, in, the com in the comparative book. We also analyzed it in the, in the overtime um, book. Uh, and and you know, there, are, there might well be reasons for supposing that, that um, ex, um, fiscal measures that can be perceived as externally uh, imposed um, m might, be, might have different uh, might, might have din different effects, and we did an analyze that in both of these um, uh, of these studies. Um, but I think, as you, you will know, and uh, I'm sure Kishore will know, it's often not entirely clear what is outside and what is inside, um, in the sense of 
what really is the the link between um, domestic politics and and external supposedly external uh, bodies. Um, in some cases, these um, these um, these measures it, it can involve uh, collusion or 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 or, or, um, or working um, together, so to speak. Um, certainly, I know in terms of the the the, the British the, the biggest British bailout in the in the post World War period, which was the uh, IMF bailout of 1976. Um, which could be seen as a kind of external body imposing uh, fiscal conditions on the receiving state. But what all the papers are now in the National Archives, and you can look at them there, and you can see that there have been a year of very detailed uh, discussions um, in which um, clearly some of the initiative was coming from the, 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 the home state um, for these conditions to be involved. So I think what, what's internal and what's external can be quite subtle. This is uh, with reference to the approaches that you have referred. Uh, surgery without uh, anesthesia and uh, boiling of the frog. Okay. Uh, in 1990s, India had a serious financial crisis. In that context, the structural adjustment and liberalization of the economy was started. But when you look at retrospectively for the last few years, more than 3 million farmers and rural artisans has committed the suicide. Okay. That austerity measure to overcome the financial crisis has uh, putting the rural people, the agrarian sector, the rural artisan in a situation of horrible condition. So what is your uh, uh, suggestion or prescription to overcome this sort of serious uh, horrible issue? I'm, I'm not sure that I got the question uh, I I exactly. Um, so let me just it's try a, to a explain what, 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 I was, what, I, what I was distinguishing here. Um, th there's an argument that, um, that, that goes, and you can see this in, for example, politicians' memoirs when they reflect on uh, what they did in times of, of uh, austerity, um, very often they see themselves as only having one chance, for example, to impose a big tax increase um, or, to, uh, or to cut spending. And that's at a particular point in the electoral cycle. That's what they say themselves. Um, and that's the argument um, for saying that um, quick action works with the political cycle. Um, slower action may cut across the political ele or electoral cycle. I think that's the idea that lies between, that, that, that lies behind those concepts. Um, but I, I'm, I'm afraid I didn't quite understand, I didn't quite hear correctly what, what you were saying about the, the Indian case. Could, could you, could you, can, can we have another try? It has come as an austerity measure in India. But its impact upon the rural economy, its impact upon the uh, local communities, it has been uh, producing as a, some sort of a reaction. The kind of reaction was resulted in committing of the large-scale suicides. So, so he's, he's, talking, he's talking about the suicides, uh, three million suicides as a result of the austerity policies. And how is that factored in all the studies um, impact? I, I, I don't know of a study, and certainly haven't done one myself, that uh, that that includes that metric. Um, and I, I I think it would be interesting to discuss how exactly one can do that. Um, clearly, it's uh, clearly it's an important issue. And I remember discussing discussing issues like that. I, I mentioned in my slide the issue of happiness and how austerity policies uh, linked to that. That's been uh, much discussed. But, but, but um, I presume that there, that there, there are issues in terms of how far one can relate um, suicide rates to austerity policies 
in particular. Often these things are not that easy to, um, to do definitively. Um, and I'm not sure um, that I would know how to do that. One is the conventional assumption that conservative parties are more prepared to impose austerity than left-wing parties. I wonder if that seemed true from the data. And secondly, in the data, did you notice any political business cycles? Again, similar to this notion that inflicting pain shortly after an election is better uh, and then stimulating the economy as you move into an election is politically better so that the economic cycle begins to mirror the, the political cycle. We did find some evidence um, for what we call asymmetric voter punishment of uh, political parties um, in the sense that we did see some evidence that left of center parties um, tended to be punished more for spending cuts whereas right of center parties tended to be punished more for tax increases. So we did see signs of asymmetric punishment, as we call it, called it. Um, and uh, so that, 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 was, uh, that, that was that observation which relates to the point you made about um, differential um, imposition of different types of austerity. Um, in, in terms of, of outcomes, I think that the trend that, that that, that, I, that, that, that I, I identified towards longer and shallower cuts over time in the UK case um, may be, um, we suggest that it, it, it may be associated with, um, w w with a different kind of strategy for uh, coping with electoral effects of uh, of austerity um, uh, in, in the sense that it may be more electorally viable um, than the short, sharp approach. Well, I think let's uh, bring the discussion to a close. You know, when, I, when Christopher told me he's going to talk about austerity, I wasn't sure whether you're going to have an austere discussion on austerity or rich discussion on austerity. It's proven to be a rich discussion uh, on austerity covering a lot of ground. And let me make also a very bold prediction that uh, the austerity issue is going to become a sunrise industry. As you know, many of the developed countries are facing serious budget deficits, budget, uh, budgetary issues. So I think I expect that uh, Christopher's uh, books on austerity are going to become bestsellers. Uh, especially to politicians <laughs> in the developed countries. So please join me in thanking uh, Christopher for his wonderful lecture. Thank you.